Yes, so uh, I will give you the latest news of this, this poster, uh, giving some generalities and then really uh, what's new in the last version. And then I will spend some time describing some details on the benchmarking of the beginning level period, which is, I mean, we already started discussing about that in the Internet General Assembly and then some conclusion and perspective. Um, Okay, so OASIS, it's a long, long story. You probably know that we started developing OASIS in the 90s. Uh, there were different versions of OASIS. We started paralyzing it in the easiness, in the, in the PRISM project that led to OASIS 4 that was not really successful. But then we had the good idea with Tony to put MCT, the OASIS 3 PI, and that gave us uh, OASIS Stream CT, and this has been quite successful. And now, with the last uh, easiness project, we produced the version 5 of OASIS Stream. Uh, yeah, cool. So, there's a big community of people using uh, OASIS. This is a survey that uh, Laure Coca, who is here, uh, realized in, well, three, three, four years ago. We, I guess we would have to redo this uh, kind of survey. And at that time, we knew that at least 67 climate modeling groups were using Wazy Stream CT uh, to couple more than 80 coupled applications around the world. You see all the groups using uh, Wazy Stream CT. And it's used in the five of the seven European ESMs that participated to CMIF 6. Uh, so, I will briefly go over some generalities for the ones who don't know Wazy Stream CT. Uh, so, all the sources are in Fortran and C. Uh, it uses, as I said, MCT, which is developed by the Argonne National Lab. Uh, everything is open source, uh, the code itself, and all the external library that we rely on. Uh, the current developers are at Surfax. There's Eric, who's sitting uh, there, Laure, and myself. And then we also have two consultants, Tony. Who's Tony? Where is Tony? Over there. And then Adria Piacentini, who is probably online. Not sure. Uh, and uh, we had some, uh, in the past three, four years, we had uh, quite significant funding from the European Commission with East Waste projects and EasyNest, but this is now ending. Uh, both are, uh, are finished at the end of March. But in, sorry. But we have another funding coming, a national funding coming with six person years uh, over the period 2024 up to 2030, which should be when I will retire. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think see, things happen. So um, here is just an overview of what you have to do to use Oasis. Most of you probably know about that. You have. I mean, the philosophy is that you don't want to change, well, you change your code as little as possible. So you just have to implement some initialization costs. And then in the time loop of your, in the time stepping loop of your couple model, you call puts, always is put to send some data and always is get to get some data. And the, the important point here is that the model does not know where it sends the data or where it gets the data from. All this is configured externally by the user for each specific run, and that's why that's how it is quite easy to uh, change uh, the coupling configuration without changing your model, the model itself. So that's the whole philosophy of um, of Oasis, uh, of Oasis uh, and Oasis 3, MCT in particular. Regarding the communication, this is just a sketch illustrating the the exchange of fields from uh, two models which have different grids and different partition. Uh, you see that each uh, process sends its part of the coupling field and it's the library and it's with the stream city library which performs the redistribution of data needed for the regridding and for the, for the, for the coupling. Um, of, uh, with the stream city can handle uh, coupling exchanges between two separate uh, executables running concurrently, but since OSI uh, Stream CT 3.0, it can also manage the uh, the exchanges within one same executable between two components 
that would run sequentially one after the other or concurrently within that same executable. So we've extended the coupling configuration supported uh, with OASIS 3.0. Uh, um, yeah, so as I said, all this is configured externally in a, in a text file. And uh, of course, you can ask the library to perform some interpolation regridding. Uh, the weights, uh, the regridding weights, what you have to do to, to match the source point to the target uh, grid point, uh, they can be either calculated online, so during, at the beginning of the simulation yeah. with the script, or we have developed a unified environment that comes with the software to calculate the weights offline, so to pre-calculate the weights and reuse them uh, during, the, the, during the run. And this uh, unified environment you can use either the script or ESMF or XIOS to pre-calculate uh, the weights. And also you can, there's a IO functionality, which is pretty, let's say basic because everything is gathered onto one process, but you can ask OASIS to perform, the, to write uh, the data to a disk instead of sending it to a, another model or to get some data from, from, from a disk file also. This is possible. Now, what's new in OSS3 in the last version, 5.0? Uh, we migrate from SVN to Git, uh, keeping the full history of uh, the, the evolution of the code. We have a new website, which is now uh, hosted at Surfax, and you have here the address. Um, we also set up a, an online, a short, what we call a SPOC, short private online course, uh, this was funded by Easy Ways. Uh, so it's, uh, you have uh, 20 hours of online course, and uh, we already had three official sessions with about more than 20 participants in total. But you can also, if you are in a hurry to get trained on Oasis Stream CT, you can ask us, and we can also open the, the, this online course uh, outside any official session. So you can, you can be trained whenever you want and whenever you ask, basically. And this has been very good regarding the, for us, because it's much easier now to, 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 to give some training. Regarding the, the tool itself and the interface, we have a new um, a Python interface, uh, which was developed in collaboration with SUC, the UK, and it's already used by SMHI to develop a tool to uh, compute the regreeding weights. And it's also used at INRIA to do some coupling between an ocean model, COCO, and a trained uh, AI model, which uh, is trained to, uh, down, to downscale atmospheric flux, uh, given the states of the, the high resolution state of the ocean. So basically the news here is that we're, we're, we're Starting to do uh, uh, artificial intelligence with, uh, with with Stream CT, which is quite nice, I would say. And then we have the new uh, load balancing tool, which is an evolution of Lucia, which in particular gives you a graphical view of your coupling exchanges, which is illustrated here. And there, with this tool, you can see where uh, one model is waiting for the other when you, you, you are wasting this basically resources. This has been uh, developed by uh, Eric in collaboration with uh, BSC in Barcelona. Um, now, regarding the regridding, the interpolation, um, and, and other stuff about ensembles, we've, uh, we've um, extended uh, one functionality of OASIS, so to, um, uh, so to, to be able to, uh, to use XIOS to, um, uh, for ensemble simulation. So now this has been, uh, I mean, so we have increased the coherence, let's say, uh, between OASIS from CT and XIOS, or the use, uh, facilitate the use of both tools in the same model. We have a, new, a locally conservative uh, interpolation, which is uh, which you should use for runoff. It's been developed by Aurore Valdoir at uh, Meteo France, and it's been integrated in uh, in Oasis Stream City by Eric. 
And uh, as I said, we now have a unified environment, so it just, uh, it just, uh, it's a di directory coming with the sources where you can uh, easily use iOS to compute bidding weights, and you can check the quality of those weights. So, and I will give you more detail about that. And something we spent a lot of time in the past two, three years is benchmarking uh, reg different regreeding library. Uh, and I will show you more detail about this and you have all the details in those two publications. So regarding the benchmarking of this, um, the regreeding libraries. So basically at the last workshop, I mean, one of the conclusion and which I guess is quite evident for everyone is that the, the uh, having a good quality and performance regreeding uh, library is very important. Uh, we performed a deep analysis of the script library, which we have in WizStream CT, and we concluded that for some grids and in some cases it was uh, not good enough. Uh, especially near the pole, and that we have to uh, offer other possibilities in the coupler. So that's how we started benchmarking different regreeding libraries. Uh, and then after an initial analysis, we decided to go on with uh, YAC, ESMF, and XIOS. We also evaluated uh, Atlas and Tempest Remap, but at the time, that was in 2000, when we started, it was 2020. They were not mature enough. Uh, so we started with these three. And now here are some examples of what you can learn with the, oh, sorry. Um, and then in this benchmarking, we, uh, we do the test with uh, 14 pairs of different grids uh, uh, involving the, the grid, the two resolution of the Nemo ocean grid, uh, one regular Latlon grid, uh, a Gaussian reduced grid, which we have in our atmospheric model at Meteo France, and two resolution of a icosahedral grid. So these are the grids that are uh, included in the benchmark. We test four different functions. So sinusoid, a harmonic, vortex, and even this one, this one in which we reproduce a strong gradient with the Gulf Stream. And we analyzed uh, five different uh, algorithms, nearest neighbor, bilinear, or bicubic, or second order, let's say, and first and second order conservative uh, remapping. So that gives us a lot, a lot, a lot of uh, results. And then we analyze those results, and now I will show you a few, few, thing, few things that, oh, that come out. Um, to, uh, to qualify the, the, the results, we use the metrics uh, defined by the Kanga project uh, in the States, and you have here the, um, the, the link. Um, so basically those uh, metrics are, uh, they propose to analyze the sensitivity, that is the invariance regarding the mesh uh, topology, uh, we think we cover that because we, we have different test cases with different pairs of grids. Uh, the consistency, that is the accuracy of the results and also the preservation of the discretization order. Uh, we evaluate the accuracy because we, in this benchmark, we calculate the, the mean uh, misfit and the maximum misfit and the RMS of the misfit. Uh, another criteria is the conservation. Uh, so the integral of the coupling fields on the target grid, the difference between uh, the integral of the coupling fields on the target and the source grid, and that gives that tells you you know if the if your if your fluxes are globally conserved, uh, the monotonicity. Uh, so that's the preservation of the the field uh, maximum and minimum, and you have here those two metrics L min and L max, which. Uh, tells you basically if your uh, remapping algorithm gives you overshoot or undershoot or if it uh, um, uh, flattens the, the function. And uh, also the performance. And I will show you some scalability curves. So this is, I mean, we calculated all those metrics for all the pairs of grid and for all the functions and for all the algorithms. So we have like a big basis of results and we looked, uh, and we looked at them. And uh, here are some uh, um, 
has some results. So regarding the uh, nearest neighbor interpolation, this gives you the, uh, the mean error, the misfit, so the difference between the, the, the analytical function at the target point uh, minus the, the, in, the, the regretted value. Uh, the maximum of the error, and here the RMS of the error. In, in red, you have uh, ESMF, in blue you have script, and uh, YAC is in purple. Uh, XIOS does not provide any nearest neighbor, or not, not if, and not uh, no bilinear big cubic. But for those three libraries, you see that, I mean, whole, <laughs> which is a nice thing, the curves, they just, uh, um, they give exactly the same results. They are they are all there. I mean, they are really there. But you just don't see them because Yak was uh, on top of them. So it's exactly the same results, which is hopefully <laughs> good news. And uh, the results are okay. Now for billionaire, or so let's say second order uh, regreading, these are the results. So again the mean error, the maximum error, and the RMS of the error, again, for the three libraries. And basically, you see here that, well, for YAC, it's not a, a true bilinear algorithm. It's, the, it's, a, it's an inverse distance weighting of the enclosing neighbor, so it's a bit different. And we see basically that, on average, it's a little bit less precise, but it does not give um, uh, worst results for the maximum of the error. So basically, yeah, the only conclusion here is that it's, it's a bit less accurate, but it's still, you know, everything is pretty valid. Uh, but, you know, it still gives you some interesting information about the different implementation of the second order um, non-conservative uh, remapping. Now here we're talking about, uh, no, sorry, that was the first order. Here we're talking about second order uh, remapping. And here I will show you uh, the, the way it is implemented in the three libraries is a bit different. For script, it's a local coordinate, it's a big cubic ap approximation. For ESMF, it's a polynomial uh, patch. And for YAC, well, we have the spherical version, you have in the report, you have references to uh, exactly what, what, what that means. And here I will show you the, um, the, the metrics that I called Elmin and Elmax. And basically what you have to recall is that if Elmin and Elmax are positive, it means, well, if Elmin is positive, it means undershoots. If Lmax is positive, it means overshoots. If they are negative, it means some smoothing of the function. So these are the results. So we see right away that ES, the patch algorithm of ESNS tends to, um, to smooth the result, uh, which is not um, surprising because there's an averaging uh, operation in that algorithm. And we also, you also see here right away that um, YAC uh, presents some overshoot uh, when the source grid is the icosahedral one. Yeah, I didn't, uh, uh, I didn't um, detail, but here you have uh, the result for each pair of grid. So basically when you see this, you say, hey, something's happening with YAC. And then, okay, so what's happening? So then you go and you look into more details and basically, the only thing you see when you have a, a detailed view of the regridded field is that, yeah, okay, YAC has, a, I mean, the, the, the maximum here is somewhat more, um, is higher than the one from ESMF, but that does not seem to be uh, really, uh, let's say, uh, anomalous. So basically, uh, it, it looks like it's, it's okay, even if it shows like a big uh, difference when, uh, on the other graph. So this is exactly the type of thing that comes out of a benchmarking. You, you see when things are different, and then you go into, uh, and then you analyze into deeper uh, um, level of detail, and then you, 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 you see if there are problems or not. Uh, now, here are the, some results with the, for the conservative methods. Um, so, uh, in for the conser for the conservative for the conservative method, you have two way of um, of normalizing the weights. 
Uh, either you normalize them with the intersected area, and that's what you call the frac area. And this is usually what we use in our coupled model. Um, but it can be tricky because if you look at what you what is done exactly, it leads to a cancel. It could lead to a cancellation of error. And that's why sometimes the hackaria uh, gives good result, but for wrong, good results for wrong reasons. If we see, if you, we look here at the results again, you know the maximum of the error, so the, the the worst point, let's say on your map, or the different uh, pairs of grids, you see right away that something is happening here for the script library, uh, which and for the uh, the other library are. Give exactly the, the, the same result. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so, yeah, just to mention that we have two scripts because there's a, you can uh, you can apply a, a Lambert projection above a certain threshold. So we did again the benchmark with the with and without this projection. Regarding the conservation, everything seems to be okay uh, because those numbers are very small. So, so we didn't look at in more detail at the script library because that was not the the point. But let's okay, let's then. So yeah, here for example for the dust area. So now here this is all uh, again the conservative remapping, but with the other type of normalization which does not cancel the error. And what you see right away, hey, hey, something is happening with the ESNF library. This is the max misfit, and, and okay, something no, something is really wrong with the script library. <laughs> That's why I wanted to move away from the script library, so I will not give the details of those uh, curves. But there's something very special happening with the SMF for when the source grid is uh, one of those uh, grid used for Nemo. And uh, so we investigated that with ESMF developers. And basically what we show here is that uh, the problem is linked to the North Pole folding. That's the error when uh, the, the, this grid is, is declared as a structured grid in ESMF. But if you use the other way of declaring grid, if you declare it as an unstructured grid with ESMF, then that problem disappears. So now the results are okay, but you have to declare this uh, Nemo grid as an unstructured grid. So these are the kind of details that, I mean, you, you would not know right away, right? But we are still working with the SMF people so that it works when it's structured. Now, very rapidly, uh, no, I will, I will skip that one. Yeah, just to say that the, we also discovered some uh, overshooting for, uh, for XIOS. For the second order conservation, there's something happening here on the coast. Uh, anyways, if you are interested and can give you more details about, you know, the, 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 the detailed results. Um, but let's, okay, I will. Uh, yeah, there was another specific problem we had with the ESMF, but I will rapidly go over this. Um, and then this is, uh, then we did also some um, uh, evaluation of the performance of the library. This is, these are the scaling curves to calculate the weights for some high resolution grids. These are the results for the scripts. And we see that it scales, but it's very bad. And uh, ESNF and XIOS here are here. They are uh, much better. XIOS shows some instabilities at you know, more than 100 uh, uh, processes uh, tasks. Uh, and SMF seems to be a, a, a slower, but uh, it, this number here includes the time to, to write the weights to the disk. And I didn't, didn't uh, know how to uh, turn that off. So anyway, so the conclusion is that ESMF and XIOS are quite uh, good uh, and much more performant than the script, and that's what we were uh, looking for. Okay, and then in conclusion, yeah, let's, um, okay, rapidly, technically, the conclusion of this benchmarking exercise was that ESMF, YAC, and XIOS are high quality uh, grid. There were a few specific problems that I showed you here, but in general, I mean, it was for, for, for specific functions and for specific algorithm. And this is uh, all work going on with the developer themselves. So that's, let's say, another conclusion of this exercise 
is that okay you can compare the library but the nice thing is that when you use the benchmarking exercise to work with the developers and to and to solve the problem so many thanks to uh, bob moritz uh, bob for esms moritz for uh, yak and Jan for SIOS because there was a lot of interaction and it was really, uh, let's say, uh, constructive uh, work. And these are some references. And I'm done my conclusion. So we think that Oasis Stream City will most likely provide a, a satisfactory solution for um, a big part of the climate community for the next, let's say, at least five years, maybe, maybe more than that. Uh, we still have some ongoing development, and I will not give more detail about that. Uh, we had a question this morning about, you know, uh, run on GPUs. We have to discuss that, whether it's important to make progress on that or, or not. And, um, yeah, as I, uh, Surfax and CNRS are committed to provide amendments and active user support and and training uh, in the coming years uh, with about half a person full time, but probably no major development. We have, uh, as I said, the tracks, uh, some national funding, and in that, uh, within in the framework of that project, we have to decide whether we further make Oasis uh, evolve or if we merge with XIOS because XIOS, as Jan will show tomorrow, is also uh, starting to provide some coupling uh, functionality. And, uh, and that's it. Oh, no, and I forgot to say, yeah, that's about it. Uh, if you are interested, I make some publicity here for a book uh, we wrote with uh, uh, Roberto Mechoso. So you have the reference here. And I'm done. And this is uh, this is uh, a word of clouds made with the uh, the user guide of Oasis. All right. Uh, thanks, everyone. I'm going to give an update on MCT and Moab coupling within E3SM. Uh, first, I was asked to show a slide like this at international meetings. Uh, I'm part of the U.S. National Lab System uh, at the uh, the one in the center here, Argon, uh, but there are several other laboratories that are part of this system uh, scattered across the country, and at least eight of those are involved in uh, E3SM. Okay. Is that right? All right. Yes. <laughs> so uh, E3SM has uh, several motivators uh, behind it. Uh, it's trying to answer questions that are relevant to the Department of Energy, the U.S. Department of Energy. Um, it's trying to uh, do um, a good job of versus the modeling according to what the rest of the community thinks uh, is, is good. And um, it has to deal with exascale computing systems that DOE is investing mm -hmm. heavily in. Uh, the ETHSM project is um, an ongoing project. It gets reviewed every few years. We just passed our review uh, in December, and so we have another uh, three years at least of funding until uh, 2026. So about that hardware landscape, and this is what it's looking like right now in, uh, in DOE. Um, upcoming machines and currently existing machines are all GPU based and all with uh, three different kinds of GPUs. So right now at NERSC, which is in Berkeley, California, there's a system called Perlmutter, which has about 6,000 nodes that have NVIDIA GPUs on them. And it has another 3,000 CPU only nodes, which is nice. And that's for uh, use by all of the Department of Energy Office of Science projects. Um, at uh, Oak Ridge in Tennessee, uh, they just stood up Frontier, uh, which debuted at number one on the top 500 um, in the fall. And that's 9,400 nodes, but that, those have four AMD GPUs per node. And then currently being constructed at Argonne is Aurora, <laughs> to be an Intel system with uh, Sapphire Rapid CPUs and Intel uh, Pontiacio discrete GPUs. Um, we also have, uh, 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 within the project, um, some CPU clusters that the project owns to, uh, to do work on. And those have been, have been uh, very handy. It's about 400 nodes total. Uh, the chart over here on the, uh, on the right is, is no longer really accurate, but it's kind of suggesting how we phased our development to uh, match how these uh, systems come online. Um, but uh, the, the, the online for these have been, have been delayed a bit. 
Um, and then these down here are artist red greens, kind of, of what the Q machine looks like. We actually have a real photo of Aurora now. I should have put that. So some of the coupler related developments since our last meeting, um, uh, and, uh, and some developments, uh, version two was released in September of 21. Then introduced um, into the model, uh, into our atmosphere dynamics, uh, this uh, concept of a physics grid. And what that does is it, uh, the dynamical core is spectral element, um, uh, but it's, it's, it's prone to some uh, uh, basically grid imprinting in some of the physics fields uh, they found. And so to get around that, uh, what, what, what you see here is all the green dots are where the physics would be calculated if it was done on the spectral element fine mesh. And instead, we calculate a finite volume mesh uh, within a core cell, um, uh, which is the uh, red lines here and the red centers. And uh, all of the physics is done only on those grid points. So instead of nine physics points per core cell, we have four physics points per, per core cell. And that um, gets rid of that grid imprinting, and it also speeds up the model because you've essentially reduced the number of physics points by almost half. Um, and then uh, it also introduced uh, uh, regionally refined meshes, uh, which is possible in both the atmosphere and the ocean, because it uses an unstructured grid as well. So you can refine the grid in both pieces. Um, the coupler remained uh, CPL7 MCT. And then just uh, this month, we released 2.1. The major difference there really is some new parameterizations in the ocean model. Uh, there's a new mesoscale parameterization from Fox Kemper that really helped with the uh, low Bernoulli overturning circulation that E3SM had. There's some additional components that we're starting to add to the system. We've added uh, NOAA's WaveWatch 3, uh, which can uh, now operate on unstructured grids uh, uh, like, like the MPAS grid. And uh, experimental still is the addition of GCAM, which is an integrated assessment model. And uh, the coupler is still CPL7, MCT, and, and 2.1 as well. And um, a little bit about the performance for V1 and V2. Uh, no surprises here. Uh, um, V2 uh, is faster. Um, these are simulated years per day on this chrysalis cluster, cluster which is A and B systems. And uh, again, most of that speed up just comes from the fact that we have about half as many physics points at the uh, equivalent resolution. <laughs> and uh, these figures show uh, how the system, how the, how the system is kind of load balanced. We still run in this uh, kind of mixed mode where the ocean is on a separate pool of processors and the uh, coupler, atmosphere, ice, and land model are all sharing another pool of processors. And um, basically the, the time is kind of reduced almost in half uh, when you switch from V1 to, uh, to V2 over here. Um, V3, which we're planning to do later this year, but I don't think that deadline's gonna, gonna stick, is still gonna be mostly a Fortran and CPU based um, uh, model, but in the works right now uh, in, in the project are C++ versions of some of the components, especially the atmosphere. And um, that is uh, being done in order to uh, be able to code to all three of those GPU types. And uh, we don't expect that to be released until 2026, even though uh, it's running right now, it, it's gonna take a while because we want, we want that uh, C++ system to be able to do all the things the current system could do in terms of low resolution as well as high resolutions. A lot of other physics packages got to get ported, so that's going to take a while. So what is the CPL7 MCT thing I keep talking about? Uh, it's actually been a while since I think it's been talked about here. So um, I wanted to uh, mention a little bit about it. Um, CPL7 is the driver and additional data types to build MCT, uh, mostly built on MCT for making a couple system. It has things like uh, sequential COM module, which is the thing that lays out the model on MPI tasks and carves up communicators and things like that. Um, there is a uh, component type. There's usually one instance of that for model. And this is where a lot of the MCT basic structures get bundled together. Uh, uh, the things that a model needs in order to talk to the system, like a global segment map and a couple of attribute vectors, um, general grid. Um, all of the mapping methods are kept in one module. Uh, that includes the uh, MCT sparse matrix to hold the mapping weights and the, uh, and the routines to actually do the mapping and the routine to rearrange to actually uh, communication required for the mapping. Um, there is a, a fields module, which is where all the fields going between components and the coupler are listed. There are usually these long strings of characters separated by colons 
uh, that comes from MCT because uh, those strings get parsed by MCT to, uh, um, uh, set how much data needs to be <laughs> to access the computer. And then, like, the actual driver and the init run and finalize methods are also in uh, a couple of routines. And so, um, and this, this collection of code has been the coupler in uh, several versions of uh, CESM and CCSM, uh, even, and also uh, the first two versions of E3SM. It's described in that paper there. There was a CPL6 with MCT that was used uh, in CCSM3 circa mid-2000s, but uh, that's no longer, no longer supported. So uh, speaking of MCT, we recently marked 20 years, <laughs> I realized. Uh, we beat the, you. Yeah, the first... Uh, oh, this is 22 years. Really? <laughs> <laughs> Not new one. Oh, wow. Okay. We tagged the first version oh, in, uh, in November of 2002. Uh, it didn't actually make it into a coupled model until ETSM 3 was released in June of 2004, and it was used in-house sometime before that. I can't remember, can't remember how long. Um, uh, so that was nice. Maybe we'll do some t-shirts or something. <laughs> <laughs> Um, also, uh, you may remember us talking about this thing called SEAM, the, the, the common infrastructure for modeling the Earth. It wasn't a CPL7 MC. Uh, yes, it was. Uh, SEAM is um, all the things that aren't the basic physical components of the model, the atmosphere, the ocean. Um, it included the case control system, which are the Python scripts to uh, configure and build and run um, a climate model, um, some tools for doing things like, like like some weight generation and some offline load balancing. And then it had these Fortran pieces like the CPL7 MCT that I'm talking about and uh, other ex and external codes like MCT and things like that. And this was developed jointly by uh, CESM and E3SM. And what we found was that the, the different science and computational goals of the two projects were making it hard for us to really uh, write to one piece of software for those Fortran parts the data models. And so uh, what's happened is, is that we've taken that part out of scene, and now uh, E3SM and CESM each have their own copies. Um, and uh, E3SMs are, are found in the, these locations here, uh, indicated here if you go to the look at the source code. Um, but uh, we are still collaborating on the case control system, the, the part in green there, and uh, that's still uh, a really good system that does all the configure, build, run, and test. So some of the developments in CPL7 MCT since our last workshop, um, we've added additional uh, land river coupling for irrigation and flooding. Uh, there's now biogeochemical coupling that goes optionally from the river to the ocean. Uh, there's an exclusive stride option in the uh, in building the communicators for GPUs, which I'll talk about a bit. Uh, there were some fixes for tri-grid configurations, which is what we refer to when the atmosphere, land, and ocean are all on different grids. There's also an um, experimental feature for two-way river ocean coupling. That's when the sea surface height actually affects what happens to the, uh, to the flow of the river into, its, into the mouth and into the delta. There is uh, addition of a carbon budget calculation. Uh, like I mentioned, we've added uh, WaveWatch 3 as a component. Um, we are uh, participating in the development of that model, uh, which allows two-way coupling with the ocean. Uh, the GCAM integrated assessment model has been added, but it's still on the branch. And uh, MCT 2.11 uh, was released in February. That includes uh, some fixes for occasional hangs in the rearranger, an autoconf update, and, uh, which supports a couple of new compilers. And thanks to Andrea for helping out with that. So um, this uh, exclusive access uh, that we uh, added to the model is for the following situation. So. Suppose you have a summit node, and um, the ocean's running on another pair of processors, so don't worry about that. But uh, we have the situation where we want to, where we typically run the um, atmosphere on this whole set of threads, and then we give the sea ice and land and run off some subsections of that, and a couple of runs across the whole thing. Um, but uh, this node, the summit node, has six GPUs, and this version of the atmosphere MMF. This is the one that has the multi-scale modeling framework. So it's using uh, uh, a tiny little cloud, 2D cloud resolving model to resolve the uh, cloud physics. And that is really expensive. It dominates the cost of the model. So we're putting that part on the GPU. And um, 
the result is this, is that we really only want to put the atmosphere instead of all 42 tasks on this node, we only want the atmosphere to be on six tasks, and we want each of them are going to be talking directly to a GPU. The rest of the model doesn't know anything about GPUs, only the atmosphere does. And um, the problem with this setup turned out to be that um, the, uh, now you have less memory to work with because uh, you're only putting the atmosphere on these six processors. It's kind of okay because most of the memory is, is we're using that GPU memory for the uh, system, but all the course physics and all that, the history and all that other mechanism, that's still running on the CPU. Um, so what we wanted to do is, is we wanted to clear these other models off of those processors. We want, we want those to only have the atmosphere running on them. Um, that looks like this, uh, da, 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 uh, like this picture here on the right. So um, what we've added is we've added this uh, feature called exclusive stride. Uh, these four things, end tasks, end threads, root PE, P stride, that's actually part of the case control system. You specify those to describe how you want the models to be laid out onto processors. And then uh, the case control system turns that into a name list. The uh, CPL7 uh, driver reads that name list, and that's how it knows how to carve up the MPI com world. So this exclusive stride option, last column here, um, uh, tells the uh, communicator to basically exclude uh, these processors from the uh, from the communicators for the sea ice and the land, and the atmosphere just owns that processor all by itself. So um, that's the results uh, in CPL seventy kind of right now. Um, I want to move down to what we've been doing with Moab, and just to remind you of some of our motivations for making a Moab-based coupler is, um, first of all, we want to have a complete mesh representation, uh, so we can do online mapping weight calculations. Uh, we can make smarter decompositions of the grid, and uh, we can do scalable uh, field data migration strategies to try, try and minimize communication bottlenecks. All that is possible when you have a complete representation of the mesh. Uh, Moab is faster and, um, has, and less memory intensive. It's, it's been written to have purely local memory for all of its data types. Uh, uh, MCT has this global segment map, which is uh, replicated on every processor. It has a global view of the uh, system. In, a, in the worst case, the segment map can be three times the size of integers times the total number of bit points. Um, you can do correct mapping of high order spectral elements to a finite volume without a need for dual meshes. And um, there's ongoing developments in Moab to support uh, GPU computations for map generation and field projection using C++ frameworks like Cocos. Moab is a C++-based code. Um, uh, we did have to make some changes to Moab, it turned out, as we've been developing this. Um, first, there had to be support for uh, non-co-located applications. Uh, Moab had assumed that all the coupled apps shared the same processors initially. That's not always true in climate. Um, and we also had to then add to Moab uh, a mesh migration concept, uh, which allows Moab to send a complete mesh description from one set of processors to another. Uh, we had to explore more functions in iMoab. That's this uh, convenient subset of Moab functions, which are callable from Fortran C and C++. Um, augment the existing parallel com functions with something that's called a par com graph that's roughly equivalent to the MCT router. Uh, change the string separator from semicolon to colon, really simple, so that it matches what MCT expects. And uh, we linked to the Tempest Remap library to calculate mapping weights on the sphere. Um, and the way we introduced this into the model was kind of, um, I thought it would made real sense at the time. <laughs> turned out to turned out to take a little bit longer than I thought doing this way. But if you, here's a here's a typical coupling interaction, right? You have the atmosphere. And in the atmosphere, you call MCT export, which loads all the data from the atmosphere data types into MCT data types. You then have an MCT rearrange to send that to the coupler, um, to the coupler's representation of the atmosphere. Uh, you might then do a mapping operation to the representation of the ocean in the coupler, and uh, then uh, send that by a rearrange method to the ocean model, where an import method is called that sends, sends things from the MCT method, MCT data type into the ocean data type. And what we basically did was we, we put in parallel the, the, uh, the MOAB versions of all those calls operating within CPL7 along with MCT. So we have like two couplers operating at once, basically. And we did that because we could compare steps along the way to see what differences are and, what this, and if we're missing something and what the source of those differences might be. So um, at the same time in the atmosphere, you export data into a MOAB data type. 
the MOAB method to send it to the MOAB's representation of the atmosphere in the coupler, use MOAB's mapping calculations to make the ocean data and then send that to the ocean. And as long as the as long as the energy import is called last, uh, the, the couple system doesn't notice anything. It still thinks it's it's in an MCT couple universe. All you have to do is switch the order or comment out one or the other of these two things for the rest of the system to see what MOAB is doing to the couple data flow. Um, some of the relationships between MCT and MOAB um, that you might hear me say, um, an MCT data is accessed by string called attributes, uh, and MOAB they're called tags, but we can use exactly the same string. Um, a group of attributes is stored in an attribute vector, uh, which is, which is uh, organized with the variable ID very fastest. Uh, in MOAB, it's, it's different, it's the more common order with the grid ID or grid number during the fastest. Um, the grid in MCT, there's a general grid data type that's just another attribute vector with some, uh, some, uh, some lists to keep the attribute names, uh, but the mesh is a first class object in MOAB. MCT is a stateless library. It doesn't have any state inside of it. So the user has to be declaring and managing all these MCT data types. Um, however, uh, MOAB is a, a stateful library. It keeps the, the state of the mesh and the tag values internally. Um, uh, MCT also has transparent data types, so you can access them directly using like percent accessors in Fortran, uh, but MOAB is opaque, you have to use methods to get and set them. Um, the relationship between the data and an attribute vector in the grid it corresponds to is implicit, done by the size of the of the uh, of the grid, the local grid, and the size of the attribute vector. Um, but in uh, in MOAB, the tags are always associated with a specific mesh. And in MCT, there are methods to communicate between components with ADs. In MOAB, you do it uh, between groups of, of tags. And then uh, some examples of how MCT and MOAB correspond. Uh, like in MCT, you have an MCT world in it. In MOAB, you have register an application, and you can give it a name. Um, in MCT, you, in you uh, initialize an attribute vector. In MOAB, you define tag storage on the mesh. Oh, I should mention this register of application re returns a very important value, which is the MOAB ID. Uh, that turns out, you, you use that then as an arg input argument to most of the rest of the MOAB calls. Which, which application or mesh are you talking about? Um, there is an MCT import function for adding data to an attribute vector. People almost never use this. Um, but you do have to use the, the equivalent of MOAB, which is the set storage. There's an MCT export, which takes data out of an attribute vector and returns it to a Fortran array. In MOAB, that's a git double tag storage. Um, and then uh, the nice thing about MOAB is you can, MCT only had a way to get one attribute at a time, but you can actually get multiple attributes at a time uh, out, of the, out of the mesh uh, in MOAB. And then finally, uh, the MCT rearranger, instead of instead in MOAB, you have a send, a, a non-blocking send followed by a receive, and it's a non-blocking send, so everything was copied into buffers, and so you have to free those buffers to do a communication between components. Um, MCT has a sparse matrix multiply, MOAB that's called it by scalar projection weights. Uh, there are a lot of functions in MOAB that are not in MCT. MCT avoided I.O. completely. Uh, MOAB does understand how to do I.O. Um, you can load mapping weights from a file that will read in, uh, like uh, mapping weights generated externally in parallel. You can get lots of info about the mesh. There's a function called write mesh, which will write out uh, the mesh and all the tags. It's an HDF5 formatted file that it writes out. Um, and it's viewable with uh, a program called Visit. Uh, there's also a compute mesh intersection on the sphere and uh, for finding the intersection of two meshes and then compute scalar projection weights for actually finding the, the weights. So the latest status is that the basic couple model water cycle case in any of time actually works. Um, we can uh, take the uh, atmosphere and the land model, which are on the spectral mesh, the MPAS, sea ice, and ocean, which are on the uh, MPAS Bronai mesh, uh, the Mozart River model, which is on this uh, regular lat long grid, and uh, stub models for wave, land, and ice, and uh, integrated assessment models, and couple them all together. So the atmosphere, ocean, land, river, and atmosphere, river weights are all calculated online, and um, the river, ocean weights are still read from a file because of special stuff that has to be done to the uh, to the river river output at the mouth. 
Um, but uh, we just got this working like basically this week. <laughs> this is a snapshot of the merged that shortwave down. So some of the future plans for this. Okay, great. Um, some of the future plans for uh, CPL7 and Moab hook up the remaining models, obviously, to the Moab coupler, um, the data models, and past land ice. Uh, we've watched three, the ones that are actually working. There's some additional online mapping options that we want to add in. Uh, Tempest Remap recently added a bilinear mapping weights option. <laughs> some from the site at Kanga project, which, uh, which ended uh, in uh, last summer uh, that we want to incorporate. Um, then remove that MCT scaffolding that we have built Moab into uh, from the Moab coupler. Um, now, there will still be an MCT coupler. There are two different directories in the, in the source code. There's a, there's a driver Moab and a driver MCT. And you can choose one or the other at configure time. And the MCT one is going to stay around probably for a while. Uh, improve the documentation of all this, do performance tuning. Uh, we're going to release it with E3S7 version 3, at least as an option. And uh, like I said, driver MCT will remain for bug fits. Okay, I believe that's all I had. Do you take any questions? All right, uh, I'm Dan Rosen. I'm a full-time software engineer with the ESMF team, and I'm doing some part-time project management as we're looking to hire a project management to fill a position at NCAR right now. Um, I'm gonna provide an update on the Earth System Modeling Framework, better known as ESMF today. You know, it's a project that's funded by different uh, agencies in the U.S., like NOAA, NASA, uh, the Navy, and NSF. So, brief overview. I know many of you have experience with ESMF by now, but uh, Earth System Modeling Framework is a parallel high-performance software infrastructure. And um, what we really mean is that it will do some asynchronous communications and keep things speedy under the hood. You don't have to see all of that. And it provides utilities and objects and data structures that you need for coupling or system applications. Uh, it's used in different ways. Now there's the, um, <clears throat> the actual online coupling applications um, that we see pretty commonly and we help out with as a team and we get most of our funding for this. Um, where you take the different components and objects, um, build them together. There's a standardization layer on top of that called Nuopsy, um, and Marianne is going to talk about that more in her presentation today. Um, and then another way of using ESMF is uh, either the command line utilities where you can use the regritter um, or ESMPy, which also has regritting built into it. Or you can just take the pieces of ESMF and you can stick them into your own application for pre-processing or post-processing. You don't have to do coupling, um, direct coupling of mo different models at all. So here we have some of the systems that we know that are using ESMF. Um, we know that there's international use of ESMF. We do directly work with a lot of the US agencies that are um, and academic research um, places that are using ESMF, but it's available to everybody. It's available for free on GitHub um, and you can use it as you need. So ESMF is a, has a structured governance body um, that regulates you know, the, the processes for changes and we call that the change review board. It's a multi-agency board that suggests and reviews and accepts the new developments and features that we want to put into ESMF. We also engage with the community with our ESMF support and uh, they provide feedback. You know, they'll tell us about bugs or feature requests or tell us about the performance issues or um, performance enhancements we can make. Um, also, we have semi-annual um, uh, releases so we do feature releases uh, twice a year. We just did one in the fall that was 8.4.0, um, and we also patch as needed. Um, and as I said before, we are open source and we're on GitHub. Um, and we have a lot more information. If you go to earthsystemmodeling.org, you can get to all of the documentation, which is very thorough. Um, we have reference manuals, user guides, and everything you can need uh, to get you started there. So today I'm going to provide some updates about what we've been working on. We do continually work on making performance and scalability improvements. Um, we like to enhance the usability of the software. 
um, and to make uh, improvements to the framework underneath. And we've added some IO capabilities over the last few years, additional IO capabilities, and we enhanced the portability too. Um, today I'm gonna to talk about three different uh, features that are uh, some highlights that we've been working on the last few years. Um, the first one I'm gonna start with is a usability feature that we've named Earth System Modeling Executable, also known as ESMX. And what it is, it's a brand new coupling application layer on top of both the framework and the interoperability layer. You know, the motivations here is that we wanted to accelerate, uh, accelerate development for new OPSI based systems um, and also introduce a mechanism that would allow you to test and you can uh, put this into your CI test now without actually even adding a coupling driver or application. Um, it's also gonna reduce maintenance since there's shared costs around maintenance of the driver um, and adding features into a driver across different applications. Uh, it also standardizes the processes for configuration and new OPSI based systems. So I'll show you the configuration files and what they look like and talk about them in more detail on the next slide. Um, but it also helps us as a team accelerate new features um, roll out. And what it really is, it, it's providing both an executable um, so you can actually just run that and uh, it provides the Nuopsy based coupled system driver so you can couple your components that already have Nuopsy compliant caps or wrappers um, of their code. And uh, it, it uses CMake to embed components into that driver and that application. So if you were to think about the structure of ESMF and the different products that we're, we're providing, ESMF has the infrastructure, like those materials, you have your concrete and you have your glass and you all stuff to build a building. Um, but you really need some kind of structure to put it together and organize it and say a door goes here, a window goes here. Um, and that's what really what Nuopsy is doing. Um, it gives you like this kind of this tem templated way of saying, this is where you're gonna start your initialization, your run and your finalize. And then this layer on top of it, this coupling application layer finally is, is a, uh, is like these cranes or these tools that will actually just put it all together for you. They're like robotics. So you can make a call to the SMX layer, build the whole application with just a configuration file um, and not have to make your own build system or um, put in your own driver or your application. Um, the configuration looks a little like this. Uh, so we have added a build configuration file in YAML language. Um, simply, you can give a list of components. So you can see here on the left, uh, we have two components in the system, Tawas and Lumo. And right now, um, it's using uh, CMake config files. So you can say, this is the location of the CMake config file for each of them. And um, uh, also, as part of the driver, it will need to know the location that services in Fortran. So you do provide you don't have to because it will make assumptions of where it is, but if you do, you can provide it specifically what the, the module file for Fortran is that says the location of your set services. Um, and then we're also expanding on this with some new configuration options and uh, build structure. Um, and then on the right, I have a example of the run configuration. Um, so this is kind of a run configuration we built off of some of the applications that we're using Nuopsy. Um, currently, and we've really embedded them into this shared driver system. Um, so you can you give a list of the components and then, you know, you can name those components, which will match what you had built into your, your um, uh, system at the build time. So you can see the atmosphere model here is named Talos, but that was the, the component that you um, built into the system. So it matches there. It also uses a standardized run sequence that gets ingested into the driver to control your connectors, like the atmosphere to ocean, ocean to atmosphere, um, and atmosphere and ocean. Uh, as always with ESMF, if it can run concurrently, it will uh, run concurrently. Um, so if they're sharing, but if they're sharing resources, then it'll um, just run sequentially. Uh, what we're going to be adding in the future is we're going to be adding an option to um, change the run configuration to use a YAML file also. A little more on the build system. So, Like I said, it's a CMake build system. Uh, currently, you would just call the CMake file 
uh, which is located in your ESMX directory, um, put into a build and then actually run the build. Um, so those two commands would actually build it. Uh, it's picking up a ESMX build.yaml file, but that uh, is, you know, you can give it a different file name in the future. Um, I'm going to speed up a little bit here. So the also provides an executable, like I said, which reads in your esmx.run config, um, as we saw in the last one. And that's configuring your logs settings, your, your field direction, uh, dictionary is also loaded in, um, um, creates the driver, loads the attributes. Um, and then it also provides that unified esmx driver. Um, which is going to be shared across applications. It also just reads in the configuration. It sets up the application clock using that run sequence that I showed um, and creates your, your model sets and loads in the attributes. And then as part of the build system too, you're also going to um, put your other modeling components that aren't part of ESMX. They they loaded in at the, the build through the build configuration and that's your model caps and everything. Um, the next feature highlight that I want to talk about is what we've added um, the last few years is a new OPSI resource control. Um, so what our motivations were here is that um, MPI scaling can be limited um, for different applications. So the scaling, it may not scale the best. So what a lot of applications can do is they add hybrid parallelization, uh, parallelism like MPI and OpenMP. Um, and then, you know, what we're adding here is uh, per component resource control. So you can control that uh, uh, optimal mix of MPI tasks and, um, and open MP at the same time. A little diagram here of what that looks like. Uh, a really simple system here. You have uh, 12 hardware cores. Um, they kind of get uh, pinned to the the pets that you have, so you know their uh, ESMF sees this as twelve different resources, and now you can divvy it up those twelve different resources, a combination of uh, tasks and threads. So in this example here, those twelve resources, um, uh, eight of them are given to the atmosphere, and which has two MPI tasks, uh, zero and one, but each of those tasks now are threaded four ways. Um, and ICE runs on the remaining four um, uh, hardware cores given to MPI tasks that are two-way threaded. Uh, these can run concurrently because they're not sharing any of the resources, whereas the ocean is running across all of them, so it uh, runs sequentially and has six-way threading. And we've actually implemented and used this in a real application. Uh, it's been used in UFS. This is what the configuration looks like. It's also what the configuration is going to look like in a uh, um, ESMX NUOPSI driven application where you can specify the number of uh, OpenMP threads per component. Um, and then uh, NUOPSI and ESMF underneath the hood will actually distribute all of those uh, resources properly. When we use this in ESMF, we were, it was traditionally, they were running threads underneath the, underneath the atmosphere, um, and they were giving two threads uh, to, to every task. Um, but what was going on is different components, not every component was threaded, so you were also giving two threads to every task, that, to each of those components. Um, when we changed, uh, changed this to use NUOPSI resource control, we configured that, we were able to both reduce the number of resources we were using by 10%, and it also ran 10% quicker. And the third feature highlight of today is the work that we've done towards um, X grids. Now, X grids, exchange grids, um, they were originally developed at GFDL uh, years ago and also introduced into ESMF uh, years ago too. But in the recent years, ESMF X-Grid has, usage has increased. It's now part of CESM, um, which uses X-Grids in the mediator for flux conservation between atmosphere and ocean. And UFUK has a presentation on that later today. Um, and then UFS, uh, they're running some experiments using X-Grids uh, in their applications to test that out. And then um, the ESMF core team is working with NASA um, to try uh, using X-Grids in their GEOS application. So I have an example here of what uh, an X-Grid, a very simple X-Grid 
application will look like where you would just have two grids um, and it, you can actually create an extra grid of more than two grids. But here you have um, side A, a coarse grid from the atmosphere, side B, you know, uh, just a higher resolution grid. But the intersection of the two grids, you know, all of the, the grid corners and points or the mesh points um, create a new point on the X grid. So that every, um, every cell in here um, on the X grid will only, will only fit into one cell It'll be within one cell on side A and also on one cell on side B. So this gives you the ability to um, do conservative regridding um, between uh, using the X grid. Um, and also, you know, the work that we've done for X grids, um, you can build ESMF fields on top of it, store data, and do calculations on top of the X grids. Um, and like I said, you can conservatively move to and from the X grids on each side from. A to B and from B to A. So, um, in our recent developments, like I was saying, hex grids have been in there for a while, but we've added support for meshes containing um, elements with greater than four sides. Um, and hex grid creation uh, has been improved so that the hex grid it's our, uh, creation is more accurate and quicker, which is a good bonus. Um, and then fields created on X-Grids can now be used as both source destinations or, or both in regridding, enabling the use of any X-Grid, uh, any regrid method or option on them. So you can use X-Grids in any operation, the regridding operations in ESMF. Um, you can also now make a call to return the cell areas for an X-Grid, um, so you can get those areas. Uh, and then there are some um, bug and interface uh, fixes. So uh, further updates, like I said, those were just three of the, the feature ones, but we've enhanced some more performance and scalability, scalability improvements. We've replaced the ESMF uh, attribute class with ESMF info. We've made improvements to VM epoch. Um, there's DE sharing between pets. Um, we made some further MOAB adoption inside of uh, the internal ESMF mesh representation. We made some uh, 32 bit limit uh, issues have been addressed um, and we're planning to fi finish all of that in the future. Um, we've enhanced usability. We've replaced the old system of um, IPD, initialization, uh, initialized phase definitions with different versions with semantic specialization labels. So now you can use your labels that say uh, model advance or data initialize or uh, you know, advertise fields. Um, and to the run sequence in Jest, we added uh, syntax for adding alarms into that run sequence um, and then added uh, ESMF profiling under new OPSI options. Um, we made some improvements to the underlying framework, uh, improved the location stream support, um, added a feature called named aliases that lets you give different names to fields that are aliases of each other, but they can now have different names. Um, and then optional, you, there's an option to auto, do auto calculation for mesh node owners, calculate that. Um, and then we added a um, interface and a feature that uh, for ESMF grid redis, uh, and that's been used in UFS for some moving grid support so that they can um, uh, have a moving grid but still output that moving grid. Um, we added some I.O. capabilities, multi-tile multi I.O. capabilities, um, and uh, we made the, the mesh create um, from file more scalable. Um, internally, we switched to PIO2, um, and then we also uh, added some support for G under portability for running with the new Mac OS M1 chips, um, so they support the G Fortran and, uh, and Clang combination there. Um, uh, all of it, this is just a subset of, of everything we've been doing on the different releases, but all the information is related, uh, is available under our release notes on GitHub. In our future work, um, we are going to make improvements to ESMX. We're going to build out that build system so that uh, it's, um, it's even enhances the, the usability, that makes it more user-friendly. Um, we're going to improve multi-tile I.O. support. 
um, and um, uh, and allow ungraded dimensions inside and uh, cases that have other than one DE per pet um, and support metadata on that on that output and input um, and uh, we're at mesh write capability. We're adding um, a field on mesh read and write capabilities, um, vector, uh, spherical vector regridding support for regridding systems via 3D Cartesian space, um, and uh, also on regridding, monotonic uh, second order conservative regridding. We're going to complete the MOAB integration efforts um, and support of dynamical, dy dynamically changing grids. Add that into it for that can be supported under the, our regridding. Um, we also have done um, some research into GPOs. We did a, um, a research, uh, research thing about it and uh, came up with some plans to mitigate the impact of models, multiple models that are residing on GPUs. Um, and then we want to address that in our future. Um, and then uh, for our NOOPSI run sequences, we want to add ability to restart at any point of uh, nested parts of the run sequence. Um, and we're going to add some time manager alarm extensions, like a regular, irregular alarm time intervals and um, uh, external trigger signals. And then we want to add field operations, which are, can be something like simple arithmetic, um, add multiply different ESMF fields together, um, merge fields together, um, merge fields together with blending. So all that is our plan for paper. <laughs> I know I'm a little bit over now, but I don't have time for you. We have for questions. I would. Yes, I think so. Okay, great. Thank you. Yep. Okay, so just a quick background about what Maple is. Yes. Um, it is a usability layer built on top of ESMF that was designed to support um, the GEOS ecosystem of Earth system models. When ESMF was first introduced, uh, GEOS was rewritten to exploit the componentized uh, nature of the framework. <laughs> and uh, has been um, heavily leveraged that since then. This is a, this, what I'm showing in the upper right here is a very uh, small subset, well, uh, a, a, a fraction of all the components that we can plug into Geos in various different configurations. Uh, and we immediately started running into issues about making sure that we did things in a consistent way and such. ESMF is very flexible, but didn't mandate enough things to force consistency across the entire build. So we started introducing additional rules. We started building layers to plug in missing capabilities in ESMF and so on. And we ended up with our own um, usability layer and, and unfortunately serves much of the same purpose that Nuopsy does. But due to, um, you know, it's convergent evolution, they're similar in some respects, but are quite different in others. And interoperability is a challenge. And we actually both get some funding from NASA to try to improve interoperability over time. NASA would love to be able to support less of our infrastructure going forward. Uh, it, uh, what Maple basically does is allow a component to provide a very, very lightweight specification for what its interface is so that it can be plugged into the framework uh, and provides a number of automated services such as allocation of fields, checkpoint restart, uh, generalized output, generalized input, and sort of a universal cap that we can use to drive any of the systems that we compose with Maple. Um, mostly this is used by GEOS and, and collaborators within uh, Goddard Space Flight Center, but we do have a few external collaborators at point. Um, Harvard uses our dynamical core and we use their chemistry and NOAA UFS uses, um, uses our aerosol component. And so there's a growing pressure to make sure that that all works together. Okay, so um, just a quick snapshot. I'm not gonna go through all this, but give a sense of you know, where Maple and Nuopsy have similar capabilities and where they have differing capabilities. Um, we both like to try, we work very closely with them. There's things in this list that were already mentioned in the previous talk that they're trying to bring in. There's things in their list that we'd like to bring in. This is sort of an optimistic view of what Maple 3 should have in it when we're done. Okay, so what keeps us uh, continue to develop Maple instead of just sort of freezing it and trying to integrate with Nuopsy? Um, a big one is performance and scalability. Um, currently, that means we've got a bit of pressure to make Maple work well with GPUs, and I'll explain more what I mean by that later. Um, we also um, need to do hybrid OpenMPI and P, uh, OpenMP, uh, um, much like was described in the previous talk. Uh, we also would like to be able to run some of our child components on a coarser grid. 
Now, Maple was designed originally to allow different components to run on different grids, but in practice, we've sort of developed in a you know monolithic grid ecosystem where everything on the atmospheric side is one grid, everything on the ocean is one grid, and then we use the exchange grids just for the surface layers, um, and we want to generalize that going forward. Um, let's see. Uh, we want to improve our ability to do nuopsy interoperability. We have a way to do it right now, but it's sort of a put sort of a kludge into our cap. Um, we'd like to explain more what I mean by how this should look in the long run, but that's that's a major priority for Maple 3. Um, and we also have sort of a recognition that lots of the developers of Maple components have used cheats that work for them, but would be fragile as soon as we start trying to extend the capabilities of the system. Mostly this is sort of unwarranted assumptions that the data pointer from one component can be shared with the data pointer for another component. Maple tries very, very hard to always use shared data pointers where possible, but Components are going further. If, for instance, parents try to directly access import and export uh, fields from their children, um, and they also sometimes modify an import state, which indirectly modifies somebody else's export state. And if we ever started not using shared data pointers, that connection would break and people would try to figure out why that was wrong. Okay, so first step for Maple 3 is to return to sort of the fundamental concept of the hierarchical design of a system of components. And, and, and make sure that we sort of plugged all the holes, make sure all the capabilities we want are described. So what I've shown here is a system with one parent component and n children components. And then we have sort of a meta component that I think of as the extended component in the gray box here. And it should itself act like a maple component. And so we have to make, what are all the rules for, depending on what's inside, what does this external component look like to the outside world? All right, so the, the obvious set of connections that we allow are between an import and an export. So an export can send stuff to an import. Usually this is between siblings, but we have cases in Geos where this is between a parent and a child. This is where people currently cheat, but part of going forward, they'll have to actually express this more explicitly. Um, we also have a rule that any unsatisfied imports of a child bubble up. They become unsatisfied imports. Well, they become imports at the next level, potentially satisfied by connections at a higher level. Um, likewise, any of the imports of the parent component itself, of course, become part of this extended component. Um, exports at the same level are also exposed in this extended component. And then finally, there's an option to re-export exports from the children. So, um, oftentimes, you, know, you don't need to consume them yet at this level, but somebody higher up needs one of your diagnostics or whatever. Okay. Uh, in Maple 2, the way we did coupling, we did very little of it, but to the extent we had coupling, if we have, say, uh, a component A that's on grid one and component B that's on grid one, and then we have two other components, C and D, that are on grid two, and all B, C, and D all want to import T, then we would end up creating a coupler between A and C and a coupler between A and D that would do the necessary gridding between T and T prime. So you can see from this diagram, we have essentially identical couplers we end up doing duplicate work because both of these couplers run at each time step. And we end up having a little bit of wasted memory because T prime is unlikely to be sharing a, a data pointer at this point. All right, so in Maple 3, we, we've gone away from couplers. Um, technically, these are still couplers, but uh, the picture makes it feel very different. What we have instead is for the extended component, this export T from component A ends up having two versions, T and T prime. And part of the responsibility for A prime is that as it runs, it generates the list of extra extensions that are needed in order to satisfy all of the imports from the rest of the system. So in this diagram, B, C, and D are all directly wired into, they're, they're sharing a data pointer with an export from A, and the actual constructed T prime is inside. As opposed to over here, the creation of T prime is done in the couplers and done twice. And you'll see in a moment that that came back to, we, we, saw, we saw this first really just an interesting concept, and then we saw it provided more and more wins with other scenarios. So we, we very much like this idea. Okay, next I have to introduce the concept of virtual versus actual connection points, okay? So user grid comps express all of their imports and exports in terms of virtual connection points. But each virtual connection point corresponds to a list of actual connection points. So here you see, for instance, um, two unsatisfied imports T from components A and component B. They bo both end up being un uh, an import at the next level up called T, but under the hood they're encoded so that we know one of them is for component B and one of them is for component A. Okay. 
All right. If we have a virtual connection between two connection points, we have to satisfy all of the actual imports. Okay. So in this diagram right here, we create a virtual connection from T to T. Uh, T the T on the left is the export. The T on the right is the import. And the component S prime already automatically had uh, the regular T that it got from its internal component. And it sees that, oh, that matches T of A, so I can just do a data pointer sharing. That, that coupling is, is, is all great. And then I see that, oh, T of B doesn't match my grid, so I need an extension. So that triggers S prime to say, okay, I've got other actions I have to run to create this T prime. <coughs> so that's all part of my export as well. And I see that it matches T of B, so I've, I've satisfied all of the imports. Uh, one thing I should say here, the kinds of things that we're envisioning doing with these extensions, of course we want to do regridding. We already do time accumulation and averaging. It's going to be pretty trivial to work this in. There's something people always want, but we've never done, is handle units changes. We don't do that often in GEOS, but there's a few places. Uh, and device copy. We'll come back to that in the GPU part of the talk. Okay. Another thing that we generalize in Maple over what ESMF provides raw is uh, uh, beyond just the field bundle and state that you can couple components with in ESMF, um, we have a notion of service services that we mentioned a little bit the last workshop. Basically, the idea here is that a component uh, may wish to have advection, but it doesn't care who provides the advection of its tracers. And some higher level parent in the hierarchy can say, ah, I can provide advection either with this component or this component, I'm going to actually choose, just like I would wire how I would satisfy an import. I can say I could provide temperature from this component or this component. I'm providing advection with our dynamical core, or I can provide it from our advection core. We can do it with turbulent convection stuff. It's not a very long list of places we do it, but it provides this ability to, to give the control to the parents that are sort of baking it into the system. Um, we've already prototyped this in Maple 2, but you know, now that we've sort of redesigned how Maple 3 is going to handle connections, um, it's going to be re-expressed rather differently in Maple 3. Another thing that we ha are going to allow is um, tangent vectors. So this was mentioned in the previous talk. Tangent vectors like UV winds do not transform the same as scalars. There's some cheats that we can, that we all sort of do. We can just convert them to a three vector, and then the three vector does transfer, uh, tr uh, transform as a scalar, and uh, each of the components do. And then you take the components and bring them back to the new UV. We're going to actually allow components to register tangent vectors as an entity in their import state. Under the hood, that will be represented, of course, as two separate ESMF fields, but conceptually they will pair component tangent vectors to tangent vectors. I'm hoping that when we do go look at components, we don't have somebody that just wants you and couple that with something else. We'll have to put a hole in our system then, but right now everything we know of, if people want a tangent vector, then that always couples to a tangent vector. Why not express that with the framework? Okay, so our strategy for exploiting GPUs. Um, so. With what we have right now, people have taken some of the run phases of some of our components and accelerated them on the GPU, either through um, a fairly advanced project that's using source-to-source -source translation uh, based, uh, boy, I can't think of the name of the tool right now, but that's for our dynamical core, and then OpenACC for a few of the kernels within our physics. But if we then look at how those kernels are embedded within Geos as an ecosystem using Maple, we have the problem that the grid comp itself can't assume anything about what other people, other components are doing. And so we find that all of the imports for that component have to be copied from the host to the device on entry. And when we're done, all of the exports have to be copied back from the device to the host. And if we do this all the time, and you can even imagine a scenario where all of the components are running on the GPU, and yet because the system doesn't know anything better, it has to do every copy at every step, and we have a very large number of very small components, the overhead for this will completely obliterate any advantages from GPU. So, how do we want to handle this in Maple 3? Um, we go back to this concept of extensions. Before, when I drew this diagram, I had T prime being a regrid. But now you can think of T prime as being a copy to or from the device. So on, in case A, we have a grid comp that's running on the device, and its natural export is on the device, but it also has an action to copy it up to produce an export that is on the GPU. CPU, sorry, CPU. Likewise, we could have another component B whose extension uh, running on the CPU, whose extension has a copy of the field on the device. And then we can couple to uh, grid comps that are running on devices or GPUs because those things are there. And in fact, those are the things that triggered the necessity of the extra copies. 
But now we will only do the copies that are actually necessary according to the wiring of the system. And the more things we get running consistently on GPUs, the fewer of those copies there will be. And at some point we'll get diminishing returns where there's components that aren't worth copying because the overhead, uh, sorry, aren't worth running on the GPU because the overhead is small. Okay, I'm gonna go very quickly through this slide because it was done quite well in previous talk. Um, ESMF created this capability to basically park some of the uh, uh, cores from the point of view of, uh, of ESMF, liberating a few cores that can be then used from OpenMP threading. Our plan, because our dynamical core uh, does much better with hybrid MPI OpenMP at, at extreme scales, was to use this uh, technique. And in fact, um, we have this working, it works well, except one small problem. It still is running the same number of processes as a pure MPI uh, system. And we found, that at least for the MPI layers that we were using, the nonlinear memory overhead was making the case that we wanted to run, which is basically, you know, one, one and a half kilometer resolution global model, was no longer fitting in memory, whereas it did fit in memory before we played these games. Uh, when we did, well, sorry, not these games. We, before we were just idling half of the processes in the physics, right? They were, they were just never used in the physics, which was slow, but it fit in memory. And now when we did this, it no longer fit in memory. So we went back to the drawing board. We still like this technique and we hope that it can be used a lot of the time because there's weaknesses of what we're doing next. But technically what we're doing next should allow us to run that scale problem on the memory available on our systems. So our new approach is to take a single um, subtree of the hierarchy that I've drawn here with the blue uh, boxes um, and a single subdomain and decompose the subdomain and create mini versions of the hierarchy. Each mini version is assigned to its own thread. So we have a picture that looks like this. So thread zero is pointing at a slice out of subdomain N. So there's no copy going on, it's just pointing at slices, but it has, but the components in, in this other hierarchy have exactly the same methods. Uh, they have the same import export states, except that they know that when we go to ask to get a pointer out of them, instead of returning a pointer to the main subdomain, it points a pointer to the slice that's associated here. Um, and likewise, thread two, uh, thread one and thread two to their own pieces. So this has some of the same look and feel of the prior system. We only have a subset of the thing that's running unthreaded. The rest of the system is not. Um, but we, we, we think that that's gonna give us the, the memory footprint we want and still keep the memory advantages. This is, this is working in Maple, but we still only have a few components that are thread safe. The other mech techni technique, we didn't have to have so many components thread safe. Our components don't need to be threaded. They don't, we don't have to instrument with OpenMP, but we still have to go through and find all the little places where we've cheated and things aren't quite thread safe. We thought they were mostly thread safe and we're finding even the components we thought were, were quite um, ethical in that regard uh, have problems. But slowly and surely we're working through that. Okay, so how do we intend to deal with nuopsy new interoperability? So first I have to sort of define two categories of interoperability. Weak interoperability is, is what we're talking about for the moment. That is we take a subtree of Maple components and wrap them as a nuopsy model so that it can live within a nuopsy ecosystem. Strong interoperability, we go to the other direction and say, we can take any nuopsy model and wrap it as a Maple component and use it within Maple. And once you can do that, of course, then what you can actually say, well, you can just do that at the level of every single component. And so then each component can be a nuopsy component if we want it to be. Um, we found that strong interoperability ran into a number of issues. And so we're backing away from that. Our use cases that are really driving us only require the weak interoperability. So rather than a more complicated design, we're doing what people actually need. Uh, so what this requires in Maple is we have to introduce additional init phases in order to handle the back and forth handshaking that's required for nuopsy. Um, and a major re-engineering of our field allocate, allocation algorithm, because now we have to have a point where we can decide, well, oh, Maple's not allocating everything anymore. Nuopsy things might be allocating some of these things and we need to recognize that and do the appropriate actions in that case. And we have to provide a mechanism for the driver that allows, um, allows it to specify the grid for the lower down components. Uh, I didn't talk in great detail about this, but Maple has this default where children components inherit the grid from their parent because that's a very common situation in the case of physics. They can override that, but they usually do. But if we try to do this system, we now have to have a mechanism whereby Nuopsy can pass in a specification for the grid at the top if that component needs one. Okay. Um, so we're going to be backward incompatible with 
Maple 2. And we, we recognize that from the start. Um, but we're trying to mitigate the complications of that for our users. We have, like I said, well over 50 grid comps at this point um, that we don't want to have to spend forever rewriting. Uh, we think we can keep this fairly isolated for them. So level zero compliance is basically saying we're no longer going to expose state information of the children at the level of the parent. There's always cheats, but the cheats are going to be much harder now. So components that want to be level zero compliant are going to have to stop doing that. And that fortunately is not all of the components, but there are a healthy number of components that will have to make changes for this. At that point, everything that currently works in GEOS continues to work in GEOS just fine, but we can't do any of the new things that we want to do. Okay. At level one, we want to be able to connect components on different grids. And at this level, components are no longer allowed to modify imports because if they modify their imports, um, that's assuming that that pointer sharing is happening and we actually instead have to have a separate export. If you're modifying an import, you do it by modifying an export and that allows the reverse coupling with the appropriate regridding necessary to make the system work. And then level two is when we want to be able to work with uh, differing devices. At this point, for a fit, the, the things we've talked about before actually technically will work at this point, but you don't get any efficiency. Because right now what happens is all these grid comps basically have list the, the imports apply to every run phase. The exports apply to every run phase. But actually some of these exports don't get activated. Um, some of these imports are only used in one run phase and not in another. So at level two, we minimally have to sort of specify which run phases um, are going to work on the device as opposed to running on the CPU. But then we also have to go back and specify, add additional metadata for the imports and exports saying, this import is used in phase one, this import is used in phase two. And of course the default will be it's used in all phases. And if you're wrong, it still works, but uh, it becomes uh, a lot more expensive to uh, do the extra copies that would be implied if you're not precise about what actually happens. How am I doing on time? Oh. Oh, I've got to wrap it up real quick. So current status, we wanted to release it over the last couple of years. A lot of things happened in late in 2022. We think we're on track for a 2023 release. Uh, the core framework is complete. We have partial implementation of the various subclasses, and we're in the process of converting various interfaces so that things are minimize the problems for the users. And that's it. All right. So I want to talk a little bit more and give examples of the, some of the scientific ramifications, not just the technical details of what ESMF does, and particularly for some of the Earth system models that I've been working with, it has really provided new capabilities for scientific experimentation that were just simply not there before. So what I want to talk about today, sorry. Uh, yeah, that one. Okay, enter. Entry. Entry. What do you mean? Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll no, just, no, no, uh, okay. Not sure what I did. Oh yeah, I guess I put the mouse what did you on do? the screen. The, the mouse was. Oh, like, the mouse has to be. You know, I don't know. Oh. Okay, so, okay, I'm gonna touch on the So, um, I'm gonna be talking about two separate things, but they're actually very interconnected. I'm going to be talking about the community mediator for Earth Prediction Systems, which is the coupler and the associated infrastructure for coupling the different components of the system. And then I'm going to be talking about a set of what I call data models, which are data components, but all have the same share code for being able to swap out a prognostic component with prescribed forcing, but all tied in to the ESMF NUOPSI infrastructure and is CMEPS compliant. So just to let you know, a lot, there are growing number of modeling efforts that have decided to adopt CMEPS and CDEPS. Um, the community or system model, this is becoming their default infrastructure, coupling infrastructure. Uh, the NOAA unified forecast system, also it has moved to CMEPS and CDEPS for data forcing in their operational system. There is another project called Earthworks that aims to run at a 3.75 kilometer global icosahedral grid. They're using the uh, 
uh, CMEPs, CDEP system, but also in uh, Europe, outside of the USA, there is NORESN and uh, CMCC, which are using these now for their next generation modeling efforts. And just recently, the COSIMA effort, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it, um, is prepared to adopt that as a modeling framework for their uh, next generation system. So this is not just a U.S infrastructure effort anymore. So let's start with CMIPS, which is the Community Mediator for Earth Prediction Systems. So as has been outlined by Dan, um, there are now ESMF NUOPS, and NUOPS is just a layer of infrastructure that comes bundled in with ESMF that effectively has introduced four generic components a driver, a model, a mediator, and a connector. The design of NUOPSI was really meant to target the ability to have an easy way, easier way to configure a hub and spoke architecture. And a hub and spoke architecture, the components don't exchange information directly with each other. They exchange information by sending data to what's called the mediator. Uh, in Rob's case, it was called Coupler 7. And then you have these connectors that are, again, generic components that facilitate transferring these data. In this type of picture, this is a single executable uh, uh, modeling framework. What you have is that these components can run on overlapping processor sets or disjoint processor sets. And ESMF is able to handle all of that. The very nice thing about some of these capabilities is, and I'll show you, uh, these connectors are automatically generated for you in terms of your very simple run sequence that you provide. So you don't actually have to do anything other than put little arrows in your run sequence, and ESMF looks at your processor layout and creates the connectors for you. That's a very powerful way of moving forward because it, the user doesn't have to do anything. So. What is the difference between what we had before and what we have now? For CSM2, this is our coupling framework. Again, it's a hub and spoke architecture. We had seven components. And every component, the prognostic components, had a prognostic instantiation and what we call a data model instantiation, where you could just have prescribed forcing swapped out. Um, all of these data models were all written MCT coupler seven. And this was our framework at that time for CSM2. What is the difference between that and what we have now? What we basically have now is seven components, but ESMF connectors, an ESMF mediator, new OPSI mediator, and again, these caps. All these caps are are translation layers between your component data structure and the ESMF new OPSI coupling data structure, both for sending data out and for bringing data in. It's an extremely lightweight layer. It does not penetrate the code base. Normally, it's just several hundred lines of code that is there to facilitate exchanging data back and forth. So where are we with all the components that currently use ESMF? As you can see here now, we have five different ocean models that are ESMF new OPSI compliant. BLUM is a NOR ESM model. NEMO has an ESMF new OPSI cap now that is being used both by, by being used by CMCC. They've just finished implementing that. For NCAR, uh, the CSM uses MOM6. And what I have here in terms of these great components is actually shared caps between the CSM model and the unified forecast system. So having these shared caps has provided the fact that you have the same model used in a completely different set of scientific scenarios. Unified's forecast system has a target for seasonal prediction. That is not an immediate target for what CSM has. So when you test the component and the cap in a wide variety of different ways, you have a much more robust system. Um, as you can see, of the UFS atmosphere and the community land models, you have a large number of components right now 
that can be accessed by different modeling systems but use the exact same infrastructure. Um, what I'll talk about in a little bit is that we also have the community data models for Earth prediction system that is in yellow. Uh, the mediator is agnostic to what's on the other side. So what you have now is the ability to swap any of these prognostic components with a data component that can use observational forcing, which we have a wide variety of support out of the box, or uh, forcing that was generated from a previous model run. And uh, everything is done in parallel with parallel I.O. And you have a vast number of regretting options that you can do out of the box. So what are the benefits of CMIPS? First of all, it has been a game changer for introducing new grids because you no longer need offline mapping files. An example, when we were running uh, the CMIPS 6 experiments, if you were running a fully prognostic case with different uh, grids for the uh, atmosphere and ocean, you needed to create 25 mapping files for a fully prog uh, coupled pre-industrial control. Now you're down to four. And those four are just the runoff to ocean mapping, which is, is custom because you have to smooth it out. So that is so much easier right now to bring a new grid into the system because these mapping files, they never you can put them out to disk, but they're generated in parallel online at every time you run the model very quickly. Um, the other thing that we've done is now the land component, because of all this capability, no longer needs to have a land fraction file. The way the masks are set in CSM and the US, UFS is that the land fraction is obtained by mapping the ocean mask, which determines the real mass, to the atmosphere land grid. And so what the land cap does is it does that as part of its initialization. It says, here's my ocean mask. I'm now going to create a land fraction internally. So you now no longer have the configuration overhead and fraction file every time you create a new ocean file that you're coupling. Um, this is not related to CMEPS, but this is an example of the power of what ESMF gave us. It ends up that with CLN, you need to create surface data sets, and those surface data sets require the creation of effectively all maps between extremely high resolution data to the model resolution. As an example, we tried to do this for a 7.5 kilometer model grid. It took over two days to do this. Um, what we did is we completely rewrote the surface data set generation using ESMF and parallel I.O. So what took two days before now takes 10 minutes and it's totally scalable because the next, what they're doing right now, we've shown that you can do the same thing for a three kilometer. So. We had reached the point before of a complete showstopper. And so with ESMF and parallel I.O., we're now able to really target extremely high resolution scenarios that we couldn't really do. We, we were limited before. I think in terms of science, this is the biggest thing, uh, biggest achievement that I can say uh, CMEPS has achieved for us. What happened before is CSM has a land ice model and we wanted to achieve the ability of running both Greenland and Antarctica simultaneously. With our older coupling infrastructure, the proposed approach was to create a unified global grid for Antarctica and Greenland. And the problem with that is that every combination, you'd have to have a unified grid. So if you wanted a low resolution Greenland with a high resolution Antarctica, you would have to create the, the global grid for that. With CMEPS, we got away from that. And so what we can do right now is at runtime, we can specify as many land ice grids as we want. And because of ESMF capability of having nested states, each of those states has a one-to-one -one, um, pair with a mediator state that is associated with it. And so we've gotten to the uh, capability of not only having the, not having to worry about a, a unified grid, but being able to have an arbitrary number of ice sheets that we run. The other thing that we can do <coughs> is couple um, in Antarctica, the ocean uh, to the land ice at multiple levels with different bathymetry. And again, this is because 
what ESMF does is it enables us to have dynamic masking. And so in the mediator, you can give it a mask because of different bathymetries for every ocean layer. So we have the capability of having the type of land ice simulation capability that we just couldn't do before. Um, I know that we talked about both um, Tom and um, Tom, I think, discussed this as an example uh, in terms of the benefits of threading. What we can do is before, if you had a component A that was going to run four ways and component B not threaded, you had to use only one quarter of the cores. Uh, with ESMF managed threading, we can have this overlap, and this actually gives you some numbers that Tom and Dan both referred to, which is that uh, before, if you were not using ESMF managed threading, you were um, getting about 3,140 PE hours per simulated year, um, and now you get not only a faster throughput, but also a lower model cost. And this is something we have not leveraged as much as I would like in CSM, but it is the capabilities there, and we want to be able to uh, leverage it out of the box more frequently. So um, Dan referred to exchange grids, and Ufuk is going to give a much more detailed explanation of exchange grid in the unified forecast system. I just want to outline how we're using that and testing it in uh, CSM. So as Dan showed, the exchange grid is just the overlap of, is a unification of two grids. And so what we validated with the exchange grid is the atmosphere ocean fluxes are actually computed in the mediator. That's the only flux computation that occurs in the mediator. And so what we wanted to show is how well does the exchange grid work? So if you have an atmosphere running at very high resolution, say, uh, any 120, which is like a quarter degree spectrum grid, and you have a coarse ocean, which is one degree, if you naively calculate atmosphere ocean fluxes on the ocean grid, which is what by default had always happened, you get a bias in the sense that the lowest level wind and the stress vector are not completely aligned against each other. They come at an angle, and that, that is incorrect. So what you had to know before is that you had to figure out, oh, every time I run the model with the different grid combinations, I need to know what grid I'm going to calculate atmosphere ocean fluxes. With the exchange grid, we did a tropical cyclone experiment, found out out of the box when you run the atmosphere ocean flux calculation on the exchange grid, there is no longer, the lowest level wind stress is completely aligned opposite to the lowest level wind. And if this is the right grid to do this calculation on. Uh, finally, this is what I meant about drawing the little arrows. Right now, what we have is the ability to have the entire run sequence represented by about 40 to 50 <coughs> ASCII files. Before, when we had MCT, we had a file that was about 4,000 lines of code to describe the temporal evolution of the system. That 4,000 lines has now been compressed to about 40, 50 lines. And what you see here is when you see these little arrows here, that's a connector. And so ESMF or NUOPSI ingests this run sequence, and it says, oh, I need to build a connector between the mediator and the atmosphere. I know the mesh is on every side. I'm just going to do that. And so the ability, you can actually edit this uh, ASCII file, change the run sequence, you're seeing the temporal evolution of your system in a way that's very easy to debug and edit. And that's, that's extremely powerful. How am I doing? Do I have? Okay, good. One minute for each of these slides. Okay, in terms of hierarchical model development, but since, ES, since CSM is a community model, there for research by a lot of the university community, there is the desire to look at hierarchy from very simplified model configurations to a fully coupled model. And what this diagram represents is, as you can see here, the increased model complexity by having just in the atmosphere a single column, 
a data component, all the way to a fully prognostic component. And so what you want is the ability to have the functionality to be able to have this data forcing available to you in a very flexible manner. What we created was the community data models for Earth prediction systems. With a data component, you can turn the feedbacks on and off in your system, and using the data forcing eliminates the coupling feedbacks. So it is a much simpler way of developing your model because you can decide when feedbacks get turned off and on. And so the debugging can be done by isolating the desired component feedbacks and then simply switching off the feedback and giving data model forcing. So what we've created with CDEPs is they are ESMF compliant data components. They can be used in any ESMF new OPSI compliant modeling system. But the important thing is all the data that you read in with these uh, CDEPs um, capability is read in with parallel I.O. And now you can do, because ESMF provides online regridding, you're able to automatically regrid the forcing data to your model data for 2D or 3D fields using a wide variety of regridding um, type of um, methods such as uh, conservative and patch and, and extrapolation. And there's also various time interpolations that you can do. But more importantly, the way CDEPs was written is that all the data components use the same share code for doing the regridding, for doing the time interpolation, and for doing all of the other IOs. So we have a separate API so that any prognostic component inside that component can also use this capability of ingesting forcing data. And that is being used, for instance, now in, in CLM. Um, so what I have here is just an outline of the various data forcings that you are now able to have out of the box when you use CDEPs. Uh, for uh, CSN, you have a wide variety of observational forcings that can be used. And for the unified forecast system, where they're much more worried about shorter time scales, those are also available out of the box. And it has been used both for regional forcing and for global forcing. So um, just to wrap up, um, the way I was going to show the data flow for CDEPs is that you can have what the way the CDEPs works is you have a set of files that all that contain fields, and a stream is just a set of fields that all share the same spatial and temporal evolution on the same set of files. So what CDEPs does, you can have multiple streams. It ingests the streams. It does spatial res uh, interpolation and time interpolation to your model resolution and model grid, and then it feeds that to CMEPs as if it was a prognostic component. And then finally, you can do the same thing where you access the share code, but directly from the prognostic component, rather than having a separate data component. So there's a lot there. I feel like I've gone very quickly through everything, but it's just to give you a sense of what's available right now and what it would be great to have more feedback on are there features that other people would want to have in this system so that's it thank you so uh, in my talk i will try to give more information related with the exchange grid implementation under ufs weather model so this is a collaborative work with Lots of people, so lots of people contribute this one and funded by the NFS and then uh, UFS RTO project. The next next slide, please. So the, the... Not sure why it does not work. Uh, yeah, may, maybe because of the same reason that we have before. Yeah, the, but I don't... The... Yeah, okay. probably you see. Yeah, thank you. Probably you see this uh, di diagram before. The, the the exchange grid is not new and originally developed by GFDL before, and then ESMF uh, exchange grid is introduced to make it available easily to support different modeling applications. It's basically a combination of different grids. 
So for example, in this example, we have two grids, but there is no any restriction to add more. For example, you can also add land grid in here, and then you can create an exchange grid using three different grids by that, that way. The exchange grid will always have the highest possible resolution in this case, and then you can use it for different purposes. Um, next slide, please. So I just want to show some basic difference for example, if you have an atmospheric model, and then, for example, let's assume that you are trying to calculate the, the flux in the atmospheric model grid. Then, for example, when you when the ocean components send the states to atmospheric model, you, you first need to interpolate to atmospheric model grid by using the weights and the, the, the states from the ocean model grid. Then you will end up a single state in the atmospheric model. And then atmospheric model will calculate the flux for you. This is the conventional approach that you can use atmospheric model grid or ocean model grid, it doesn't matter. In the exchange grid, it's a little bit different because in this case, rather than doing the interpolation first, you are calculating the flux first using the data provided by the another component, in, in this case it's ocean, then, then you will end up having a four different flux. Um, value for because the ocean model is high resolution you will end up four different flux and then in the last step you are doing interpolation to have a single flux a value for the atmospheric model grid so the, the, <laughs> the logic is similar but as you can see because of the non-linearity of the com com computation the second approach will produce a little bit different answer for you which we are thinking that is much more correct because you are using higher resolution information in here rather than losing that information in the first step interpolation in the in the conventional approach uh, next step next next slide please so this is a real real example uh, coming from the ufs feather model for example in this case the atmospheric model has t96 cube sphere grid the ocean model has one degree grid the, in this case the ocean model is mom6 so as you can see, the, 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 the both grid is very similar, except we have higher resolution in the equatorial region in the ocean. And if you combine these two, two grid together, you can see the exchange grid over there in the solid black box. So you will, you will end up higher resolution grid, and then you can calculate the fluxes over there in a, in a highest possible resolution. So this is, a, uh, this is an example. Uh, you may you may you may notice that there is no any mesh over land because at this point we are just interested in calculating the atmosphere ocean fluxes. So we didn't create exchange grid by including the land too, but that's also possible. I will I will talk more about that later. The next, please. So for example, in the in the next slide you are seeing some difference because in this case the ocean model is zero point. 25 degree is higher resolution, and then you will you will have exchange grid in a higher resolution that represent both grid in together. So, for example, if you are using atmospheric model to calculate atmosphere ocean fluxes, then you have to go with the conventional approach, and then you have to you have to calculate the fluxes in a coarser resolution. It, it, this is the re regular application in the in the in the in the UFS weather model at this point because the atmosphere flux, atmosphere ocean flux calculation is done under ATM before this implementation. So uh, next, next uh, slide, please. So this is the overall uh, structure of the UFS model, weather model. So as you can see, it's very complex. It has lots of different components. Less of, lots of different target application in here. For example, there are some S2S application for the seasonal forecast. There are some application related with the hurricane <laughs> forecasting, the house application, the coastal application that Karsten mentioned in the, in the document, also another application. So there are lots of different applications supported by the same modeling system. So because of that, it needs to be flexible. Um, as you can see, it also shares CMAPs and CDEPs with the CSM. So the CMAPs is a central part of this modeling system that allow interaction between different components with different 
where it's waves. Uh, the, by the way, this is not the recent version. The, 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 the model is evolving too fast. And then every, every day, another component is come, another configuration is coming. So it's, it's, it's very dynamic environments. And developing in this very dynamic environment is, is a very challenging task. Uh, the, the next uh, slide, please. So the, the motivation for CMAPS exchange implementation is basic because the, the CMAPS is shared with the different modeling system and then it will be shared with others in the, in the near future. So if you, if you bring some feature to CMAPS, then that feature could be also used by other modeling system. So the first motivation is computing surface flux on exchange grids will guarantee that flux are computed in the highest possible resolution. So this will give you a capability to, to, to do the flux computation in the highest possible resolution. You don't need to worry about uh, resolution of atmosphere, ocean, or another uh, component. It will also bring uh, some capability to do scientific experimentation. For example, you can easily change the flux computation doing on atmospheric model grid, ocean model grid, or exchange grid. So it's just a runtime configuration option. So you don't need to worry about having another code, bringing another uh, mod modification in your development. So everything is over there. Uh, and developing these kinds of in infrastructure will create the much more tight connection or co collaboration with the different uh, uh, the agencies, for example, GFTL, NCAR, ESMF, the CMFs, uh, developers. So everybody can, can benefit these kinds of features. And of course, CMFs is also <laughs> supports key data, data structures and coupling approaches like calculating the atmosphere ocean fluxes on exchange grid. The next slide, please. So if you look at closer to UFS weather model and its atmosphere ocean flux calculation scheme, the, the FE3 ATM, the CubeSphere model, basically use CCPP. CCPP is a common community physics package. And there's a specific, a specific uh, um, subroutine over there that calculates the atmosphere ocean uh, uh, fluxes. So CCPP has two different uh, part. One is the framework, another one the physics caps. The framework basically use the physics caps to, to auto-generate the code for the host model. In this case, the host model atmospheric model in UFS uh, example, but the host model could be anything. So you can, you can, you can use a suite file, which is defined as an XML file, and then you can, you can use that suite file and then auto-generate the code for you, and then you can use that physics uh, package under your host application to calculate different fluxes, radiation, surface fluxes, everything. And then also this CCPP layer uh, merge the, the fluxes coming from the different components. And it has also fractional grid representation. This is a little bit different from the CSM because CSM is merging all those fluxes in the CMAPs. But the UFS is not using that approach at this point. The, the next slide, please. So if you want to use the exchange grid under, under UFS, since you know that the atmosphere ocean flux calculation is done under FE3 CCPP, so because of that, the atmosphere ocean flux calculation is always done under atmospheric model grid, so you don't have any flexibility over there. This requires ena enabling atmosphere ocean flux calculation in mediator. So in this case, we have two different uh, approach. Uh, the CMAPS has already has its own atmosphere ocean flux calculation scheme, you can use that one. Another option, you can define C CMAPS as a CCPP host model, and then you can drive very basic, uh, very basic suite file to calculate atmosphere ocean fluxes. We, we decide to go with the second way because we want to compare the fluxes coming from the C FE3 ATM CCPP with the fluxes calculated under CMAPS due to the validation purposes in, in this case. 
the, the, in this case, we are using very simple suite file. This will also enable to calculate land fluxes because the, for example, no MP land model is a part of CCPP. And then you can also drive the land component, land flux or land component under CCPP through the C maps. And then you can also calculate the land fluxes over there. So this is very flexible approach. And then you can easily extend it by using this uh, CCPP host model under C maps. The next, next slide, please. So if you look at this design, FE3 has, FE3 has Defined, the FE3 is defined as a host model, CCPP host model. This is the regular uh, configuration under, used under UFS weather model. We, we define another host model under CMAPS. So this is the first application that use two different host model under same modeling system. So because of that, it was a little bit challenging, but we, we saw all those issues. And then at the end of the day, we could have uh, another host model under CMAPS. As you can see this XML file, we are calling the surface ocean just as called under FE3 CCPP. So the code is same, the code base is same, everything is same. The other parts, the other, other, uh, other um, steps is required to, uh, to, to calculate other stuff. But the, the, the central part is the surface ocean. Um, the next, uh, slide, please. So as a part of this development, we create a, another regression test. The regression test is basically a suite of tests run on the UFS weather model in every PR. So by this way, you will be sure that you are not breaking any other application that's used on the UFS weather model. So we create another regression test. By default, it's use A grid. A grid means it calculates the fluxes on the atmospheric model grid, but it calculates the fluxes in the C maps by running the CCPP. But but you can you can change it just it's a it's a nameless option. So you can change it in the in the ESMF config file, and then you can calculate the fluxes in the exchange grid. There is some information related with that one. You can run this specific test, single test with some commands. So I don't want to give too much detail about that. The next slide, please. So to, to validate runs, the, because we introduced this new host model and then we introduced exchange grid and then we want to calculate the fluxes over there. The first thing is that you need to validate your way and you have to show that it's creating a very similar results with the existing, uh, existing configuration. In this case, the A grid means that we are calculating the fluxes in the C maps on A grid, the atmospheric model grid, and FE3 CCPP also calculates the fluxes in the atmospheric model grid. So by this way, you can compare fluxes calculated in the two different plays to be sure that they are same. So we did lots of different runs those are 35 day runs because the current S2S application targets 35 days. And uh, you can see some, some details over there. I don't want to give too much information about that, but please, uh, next slide. So, uh, there are two different plots in here. We are trying to, uh, see the benefit of the exchange grid to calculate the atmosphere ocean fluxes. I, I don't want to mention, I don't want to talk about too much related with the low uh, coarse resolution ocean because in this case, you it's hard to see the benefit of the exchange grid because the grids are almost identical. But if you look at the higher resolution ocean, if you calculate the fluxes on the atmospheric model grid, which is coarse resolution, you can see this patchy kinds of structure which is normal because you are calculating the uh, fluxes in the A grid. And if you, if you send that fluxes to ocean, it's still same. So you are, you are, you are transferring the coarse resolution information to high resolution. If you, if you look at the right hand side, the exchange grid, uh, and then you can calculate the fluxes in the exchange grid in the higher possible resolution. If you, if you look at the bottom, if you compare the ocean grid uh, uh, case, which fluxes is calculated in the atmosphere, A, A grid and X grid, 
you will see much more finer scale structure in the in the in the region. This is coming because you are calculating the fluxes in the in the highest possible resolution, and when you are transferring the, that data to ocean model grid, which is high, you are not losing too much information. You are not losing information in that case. So this is the main benefit of using the exchange grid. Um, next slide, please. Uh, this is the side-by-side -side run. So side-by-side -side means we are calculating the fluxes under CMAPs using CCPP host model, but we are not sending those fluxes to atmospheric model because we don't want to, we don't want to change the answer. We are just looking for comparing the fluxes coming from two different places. So you can see latent heat, sensible heat, momentum, fluxes, and in for six different tiles for single point, as you can see, the CMAPs could able to reproduce the fluxes that's calculated under FE3 CCPP. So there is no any issue in terms of the temporal evolution, the initialization, everything looks fine. So this gives us a confidence that we are doing something correct in here, and then we can go fully coupled configuration to see what's changing over there. Next slide, please. So uh, this is the results after 35 days simulation. Of course, this is also coming from the side by side. So we look at the temporal evolution of the single point, but it's always nice to look at the uh, look at the spatial structure of the uh, bias, not bias, but the difference between two different uh, uh, fluxes computed in the two different places. Uh, as you can see, we have some difference over the Arctic region. This is normal because at this point we are assuming everywhere is ocean because the composite step in the CCPP. So we are looking the fluxes just before combining those fluxes in the CCPP layer in the FE3. So because of that, seeing some large difference over the Arctic region or the region with the sea ice is normal. So don't worry about that. But we have also some difference in the other place, which is not high, but we are seeing some difference. This is because uh, the the I will I will show an, another time series later, and uh, this is this is because the, the 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 solutions start to diverge after a couple of weeks, and then you you are seeing that difference in here. Another another reason of this uh, small difference is that we are not calling atmospheric ocean flux calculation in the same place that's called under FE3 CCPP. Uh, that requires ad additional work in the FE3 side. We have to split the physics um, physics to uh, different pieces, and then we have to interact with the specific, specific step over there with the CCPP. So that requires additional work, which is not important at this point. But I am, I am looking for that kinds of solution for another project uh, because I am trying to bring a external land component to UFS. Next slide, please. So these, these are the time series for 35 day simulation for different regions. So we have uh, Gulf of Mexico, Nino 3.4, Gulf Stream, so as you can see, the, 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 the runs, the reference means the, uh, the, the, the original configuration. The A grid means that the flux is computed in the atmospheric model grid, but on CMAPs, O grid, ocean grid, X grid, exchange grid, and the, the, the two different resolution. So as you can see from this plus in some region, for example, the Gulf of Mexico or Gulf Stream, and the, the, the solutions start to diverge after a couple of, uh, after two weeks. So because of that, you are seeing some kinds of a difference at the end of the simulation in terms of the flux calculations. If you, if you look at, for, for example, first two weeks, that, that bias will be very minimal. Maybe you can't recognize any, any difference over there, which is normal. But the good thing is that the black line is the observation, the optimal interpolation sea surface temperature in this case. So all the all the runs are very uh, very similar to observation. The next next uh, slide, please. 
we also did another plot. Uh, this is the accumulated flux components. So we are just accumulating flux because, okay, for a single snapshot, you can see they are behaving very similar. But if you start to accumulate the fluxes over time, you might see some large difference. And then that, that's, uh, that's another way of uh, validating the implementation. So all the runs are very really similar. Uh, for example, the, for go, golf stream, <laughs> if you look at the golf stream, the sensible heat flux, it starts to diverge. For example, you can see uh, the distinction between the low resolution simulation with the high resolution simulation in there, which seems um, the low resolution grids tends to overestimate the, overestimate the sensible heat flux. But still, we need to do more validation, some realistic application. I just run the model for a standard configuration. So uh, the, 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 the UFS team, the science team needs to, uh, needs to do more um, check with this implementation still. Uh, next slide, please. I already need uh, to run in a couple of minutes, yeah. Uh, sorry? You've got a couple of minutes more, yeah. Yeah, okay, this, this is the last uh, slide. So the, the potential future developments for uh, this application, um, the, the, we need to do more, uh, more tests with this uh, application, with this configuration. Um, adding component version of land model to exchange to exchange grid will give a more capability to calculate the fluxes in the different uh, uh, mediums. So at this point, I am, as I told you before, I am working another project to bring external land model. And maybe the, the extent of this project could be adding the land atmosphere uh, flux computation on the exchange grid. Uh, the, you, the, 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 the feature is over there and then you can use in in your application. So it's just a matter of changing the, uh, the runtime configuration option. Uh, <coughs> along with this work, we see a couple of issues related with the CCPP. Uh, for example, the, the, as I told you before, the CCPP physics needs to be splitted to different calls to ingest uh, data exchange in the same place that's done under UFS atmosphere CCPP approach. That will give us a more uh, flexibility to support different applications. Uh, CCP could be defined as an external component because there is no any restriction to create a, another NOAPSI cap top of CCPP and then use it as an external component. By this way, this will give you a this will give you a capability to that. For example, some other external components could send its grid to CCPP. CCPP calculates the fluxes over that grid and then send it back. So that will give a more flexibility in terms of supported application. Of course, it requires additional development, but yeah. And CCPP also needs to include some IO capability because if you want to restart the CCPP, you need to read some fields. At this point, we implement some IO capability under um, CCPP host model under CMAPS. But if CMAPS, if CCPP supports that IO capability out of box, that will be great for us because we can get rid of that custom code. Uh, the next slide, please. So uh, that's all in my side. So if you have any question, just let me know. Thank you.